Hey, Funkhauser. <laughs> Time is it? Well, now it's seven o'clock, right? No, it's not. Yeah. yeah I, I think I think the idea of starting at seven is going to go out the window. Why? Well, let's just see how people get populated. Hi, Tony. You think it's too early or too late? Oh, you mean starting? <laughs> it's already begun. It's too late. It's too late too for late. any of us. It's too late it's for all of us. <laughs> Let's see. Sound good? Good. You could decide how spiky to make that sound. Could be spiky, could be unspiky. What's that? The sound of the virus. No, what's he putting up on the screen? Edwin, what is that? Can you read that or not? How you turn the virus into music. You, ah. Sonification, you take the data, you take its, its rhythms and forms and make sound out of them. I think because everybody is so small, it's impossible to read that. But you know, that's just that's just because you have the gallery setting. If you switch to the other setting, everyone gets big one at a time. But if, yeah, Click but on the I other don't one, see everybody that big. Well, you see whoever's talking that big, yeah, or whoever right. Edwin decides you should see at that moment. Yeah. Like there, we see somebody's keyboard. It's really cool. From the side. We see your eye and your keyboard. Hi. Nothing else. The keyboard and the eye. Excuse me. Yo. Hi. I heard you. Um, so I, I happen to be blind, and I might not be the only blind um, person joining the meeting. So if you think about it and it feels comfortable, 
it would be great if you could um, describe anything that was being presented visually. Yours, you have the most interesting visual appearance so far. <laughs> doing the best with this. Thank you. We'll explain everything. Awesome. Thanks. What's that shirt you're wearing? It's very interesting. Mm. <laughs> right now we are seeing a screen that has a lot of kind of a, a checkerboard type of configuration and inside each checkerboard there is a person and each person is inside of their um, particular environment and everyone's environment is slightly different. Some people are sitting on couches, some people are sitting in front of books and in the and one person is is um, has a screen of the mountains behind him. <laughs> um, and then um, what's important to this image is that in the upper uh, right hand corner there's a checker with a person Elizabeth who is on a gigantic chalkboard and she's drawing uh, with her body, uh, the chalk. She's using the chalk and she's drawing as we will be speaking. So if you can just in your mind imagine um, a big gigantic chalkboard with Elizabeth drawing on it while everyone is speaking. Thank you, Kristen. This is the sound of the coronavirus. Scientists from MIT have turned the structure that causes COVID-19 into music. They took the amino acids and converted the entire protein into a score. The piece is 110 minutes. They chose the koto, a traditional Japanese stringed instrument to play the music thanks to its soothing sound. I'll put a link to this article in the chat. They feel this is a faster, more intuitive method than conventional methods used to study proteins. Understanding how note structures work within each other could be a way to figure out an answer. The article is in the chat. Is that an Sorry, Edwin, is that an answer like a medical answer or a spiritual response or what? Oh, no responses, no, no. Thank you. You can feel free to pin frame Elizabeth on the chalkboard throughout this reading. You can choose speaker view, it's up to you. I'm going to read everybody's bio, and then we're going to start, and we're going to have a discussion at the end. Thank you all for coming. Here we go. I should say this is all um, um, work that's inspired. Um, 
by the book, the one that's in your link, in the link that I sent, The Body and Language, where a gathering of, um, of artists and poets and um, communicators are aware of how to integrate the self in their work. Whether that's called body or self or awareness, it's all connected to how we are seeing ourselves in our work. Um, there's more to talk about that later. We'll start. Kristen Revelay is a poet and teaching artist whose work integrates poetics and somatic into what she calls trans poetics. She is the author of eight books, including I, Afterlife, Essay in Morning Time, and Everywhere Here in Brooklyn. If you're interested in listening to the recorded playing, to the recording playing in the background of her reading tonight, it's separate than what you just heard now. You can find it at transpoetics.com. The, the, the bio information is in the chat. Daniel Borsutsky is the author of Lake Michigan, finalist for the 2019 Griffin International Poetry Prize, the performance of Becoming Human, which received the 2016 National Book Award, and his other books include In the Murmurs of the Rotten Carcass Economy, Memories of My Overdevelopment, and The Book of Interfering Bodies. He teaches in the English and Latin Department and Latino Studies Department at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Sharon Mesmer's most recent poetry collection is Greetings from My Girly Leisure Place from Bluff Books. Four poems appear in Postmodern American Poetry, a Norton anthology. Her essays, reviews, and interviews have appeared in the New York Times, New York Magazine, Paris Review, American Poetry Review, and the Book in the Rail. She teaches at NYU and the New School. David Rothenberg wrote the books Why Birds Sing, Bug Music, and many others. He has 30 CDs out, including One Dark Night, I Left My Silent House on ECM. His latest books are Nightingales in Berlin and The Possibility of Reddish Green. Rothenberg is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and Music at NJIT. And finally, Elizabeth Castagna is an Alexander Technique teacher and an artist. She writes, my paintings are a direct expression of my relationship to my body and the stories it carries. Physicality, movement, time, and water are the base elements for this process. My body moves as my mind moves, and it's this unity that creates the gestures that flow through my work. I'll start with a short piece of mine with Elizabeth in the background or accompanying. There's a lot of seams being shown tonight. A lot of the Emperor's clothing will be on display. So, just letting you know. Okay. I'm, I'm watching her on my screen a little bit. This is called In Semblance of Being. Roaming isolation disappears on cue once home. Too many walls to return to, too many sudden walls. What if I were to suddenly alive for no one? Surprising definition with instinct, my oldest friend. So much passage for one being, so much adolescence in one lifetime. Who was receiving all those messages but me? Growing new ear canals. To alive is always, to affect scatter shot. I swear to have seen what once derailed me. I swear to lives worn through. I crossed retelling, rewired in the evolution of new limbs to dare the survival of the porous in times of calamity. Life is a time of calamity. The net caught by its swipe, finger swipe neural, the instant of phenomena as derailment the metaphor outside this window to familiarize my displacement. Who is moving through but through? Who is receiving but receiving? Who is not there but everyone? Dare the world its flaw. I swear to have seen what once amazed me. I swear to lies worn through. Dare the bird its beak. I crossed the untellable to find one connection, just one. 
outside these walls. Dare the lines cross, the heart's pulse invades my sleep, my wrist, too supple for dare, resides as opening, as pencil grip, to know who was it all this time I was talking to, but all myself. Who were all those receptors of words, action, ability, but me, looking for connection, me. Who were my careful arrangements of descent? Here, in the letting go of immediacy, my cycles of immediacy, my relevant chambers of inconsistency. Dear body, to get up, to leave, to get back. Dare the get back to tell you something. Who gets something from the get back? The wind against the window, the air vent over the stove, the heat whose touch escapes. Get up, leave these walls, move to something familiar, to not familiar, to something. Now, uh, Kristen Prevalet. of calm, the jaw of calm, the lips of calm, open of calm, the river of calm, the cliff of calm, the corona of calm, the rock of calm, the bridge of calm, the fire of calm, the street of calm, the sheet of calm, the flow of calm, the bed of calm, the soil of calm, the muscle of calm, the shoulders of calm, the vein of calm, the heart of calm, the moon of calm, the sun of calm, the Virgo of calm, the horror of calm, the detective of calm, the fantasy of calm, the book of calm, the soul of calm, the heavy of calm. The way that you imagine the anchor dropping down into the water. The calm is anchor, the calm is blowing, the calm is enclosing, the calm is pacing, the calm is extending, the calm is streaming. The calm is collapsing, the calm is sunning, the calm is disinfecting, the calm is grounding, the calm is paving, the calm is burrowing, the calm is sorting, the calm is eclipsing, the calm is relaxing, gradually moving down even deeper. Edwin, turn that down just a little bit more. Even deeper. Down Even deeper. Feet. I spend my days to the earth. listening to humans, talking feet. about transforming what it means to be human without anxiety, without triggers, without insomnia, without dread. A dull kind of crying, waterless, paced, no ambition, no hope, no attachment to anything that passes the time and anyone I might want to love. There will be a moment where you will 
completely and totally surrender to surrender to it would be easier to be human on top of a mountain alone with the goats who roam satisfied eating the bark from alpine pines just me and the smoke of my little fire speck to the satellite microbe to the pandemic When your body Whoever said this human thing is some kind of drive in divine consciousness, as if that were anywhere to park. When your unconscious mind comes forward, you but here we all are, anyway, birthed from the goddess's thigh and then swallowed whole, incubating in her bile, sailing through space. Higher self, unique self, disorderly self, child self, swallowed self, ordinary self, aesthetic self, changed self, evil self, enshrined self, conflicted self. Semblance of the senses, play of the senses, dissolution of the senses, eruption of the senses, explosion of the senses, drunkenness of the senses, obliteration of the senses, curiosity of the senses, monstrosity of the senses. Without any anxiety. That you can feel a wave. By talking storm, elderberry storm, immune system storm, sublime, beautiful storm, river storm, struggle between two souls storm, blasphemous obsession storm, subconscious storm. Perhaps you know that feeling of just floating. Room of instruments, music plays itself. Perhaps you know that feeling, a pool or the ocean. Wind blows, vibrations, every note unpacked finds ultimate purpose. Infinity of strings, the soul in order has no purpose, only moments. Where the spurt wars with the flesh, the spirit wars with the flesh, you fall out of alignment, feel the flesh rage and rebel, lie weeping on the ground. And as you magnify, magnify a wave, a current, a ride, a garden, a mystery, a Ferris wheel. A feeling of calm. You wait in line for a wild ride, only to find it ends so soon. And the line for the next one is twice as long, etc. You wait in line for a wild ride. Again and again you wait in line for a wild ride, only to find it ends so soon. And the line for the next one is twice as long, etc. You find yourself waiting in line for a wild ride, only to find it ends so soon. Two seconds later, you're back in line again, waiting again for a wild ride. Until now, for a moment you live, irrelevant to that perplexity, washed, sitting, straight, cleaned up, devoid of clutter. You move from your body into the trance that connects you to what some call angel, alien, unreality, loving, confidence, healthy, minded, just present, controlling energies, calm, smile, extended over your face for the thunder is gone and beyond you. What you call the hinder part is smaller and smaller. You can be aware, you can be aware. Hard to see, now in the distance, a dot in the sky. Can I stay here forever? They asked, loosed from strings and now floating untethered mind. They said, that's not what's happening, not the new normal, not the new center of personal energy, subconsciously incubated as afflictions of the tempest irons come back to the planet. Don't let it go, hands off, let it burst forth, unaided to open into flower as suspended in space the waves of thought we follow are the ones it's fine we carry to open into flower into flower we carry the waves to open thought into thought we follow the waves to open flower 
until flower rubs up against thought of continuous suffering, incredible, bounteous, squashed. Everything floats before your eyes, but leaves no impression, until flower moves into negative space, when it could open to a better life, a life not correlated with death. To whom do I want to spend my night? To whom do I want to disappear? With whom do I want to go in to trance? A mind attentive to the state of things. Are you alone? Are you arguing? Are you interrupted? Are you flowing? Are you in isolation? Are you masked? Are you seeing the truth? Are you living lies? Are you escaping? Are you breathing? Are you in love? Are you vulnerable? Are you sleeping? Are you watching? Are you bored? Are you listening? Thank you, that was an experiment. I hope um, you could hear that uh, simultaneously. Uh, that soundscape was by a good friend of mine, Stephen Brent. So shout out, shout out to him. So that was just trying to experiment with Zoom and audio. So thank you um, for the opportunity, Edwin. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. And next we have Daniel Borsutsky. Right. Good, good evening out there in Zoom land. Uh, Edwin, uh, thank you very much for um, putting this together, uh, for putting the anthology together, for making all this happen. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Um, there was somebody who cannot see who um, requested a visual description. Um, nothing particularly interesting is going on behind me. There's like some books and it's, um, you know, very wooden, but there is, um, Elizabeth is uh, on a chalkboard, it appears. Um, being shot from above uh, and drawing um, and making motions with her body as she lies on it, um, drawing a kind of beautiful um, series of uh, circles and constellations that look like stars exploding in our computer screens. Um, I will read uh, a few pieces. I'll start with a newish piece uh, called from a series of kind of poems that, that have, uh, are titled by the day. This is day number 423. The beach is burning in the middle of the city and they tell us the lake is not dead, but we know it has disappeared into the chemical blankness and the sand is full of disease and the water is full of petroleum and the water is full of bodies with cadmium and arsenic in their ears. They have lead in their mouths. They are falling out of the sky or they are bones in the earth. They are clinging to something. They are clinging to each other. They are clinging to the air, to the trees, to the breath, to the night. And you are a wounded shoulder in the hypnosis of the emergency. You are shrapnel and inexhaustible love. You wear a mold mask of shame. You see shame in the growth of the willow trees and the locust trees and the red cedars. Your bones are martyrs. And on the other side of the beach, there is water, but you can't see it. They will not let you near it and the waves are frozen and you can feel them like fat or hair or dead skin on your body. And there is the irritating hum of time and death, and the living who are dying of so much living, of so much time and death. They are searching for life. They are ghosting the ghosts who chant life like a curse word, a forbidden word, a disease word. And you want to see the lake again, but they say you need the right code, the right mask, the right spacesuit. And you want to see your child again, but you need an illusion, a canticle, an executive order, a cheek, a chin, a tomb, a monument to the earth, a monument to the hysteria of the afternoon, a monument to the rhythm of the sand, a monument to the disappearance of the bodies who are breaking in some other lake, who are breaking on some other beach who are rioting in some other death march. 
The translators of the silence do not know how to translate the translators of the sand, and in the frustration that grows between them, there is something so ordinary, a corpse so ordinary that no one wants to disturb it. No one comes to appraise it. No one knows how much it costs or where it has been fabricated. It is day number 423 and the sky has disappeared into another sky and the beach is shrieking the shriek of a thousand broken shoulders and I am dying from too much life in the blankness that unravels into the economy of a beating, a burning, the guilt of this innocent lung, the shame of this atrophied bone, this bloodied body, this bloodied child, this blank that consumes the image of how you understand who you are, which is wrapped up in the image of how I understand who who I am, and you don't want to die. To, and you don't want to die today, but you might. And I don't want to be alone today, and I don't want to die from so much life. It has given me so much. To all of us, we break, we are broken. We are little imitations of our corpses of eternity. Don't wait for us to die. It is day number 423, and shame covers my body with grief, and grief covers my body with shame. Only 876 people died here yesterday, and I was not one of them. And today and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and today I, know I will not be one of them, and shame will cover my body, and grief will live in my face, and shame grief will be molded into my teeth. Grief shame will blow air into my mouth, and I don't, and I won't die alone today. I'll eat bread, I'll eat rice, and kiss my child, and say thank you, thank you, thank you, to salt and to sweat, let, to salt and to sweat, and to boredom, let peace explode on my body. I'm alive and condemned and undone. Take a word and replace it with another word. This is the most miserable place I have known. Take a word and replace it with another word. This is the most miserable life I have known. Take a verb and replace it with another verb. The river swallowed my face, my mouth, my body, my arms, my hands, my legs. Take a verb and replace it with another verb. The river loved my face, my mouth, my body, my arms, my hands, my legs. Take a noun and replace it with another noun. The authoritative body loved my face, my lips, my teeth, my tongue. He loved me. Take a body and replace it with another body. Take a verb and replace it with another verb. The bureaucrat killed my face, my lips, my tongue, my teeth. He killed me. Take a blank and replace it with another blank. The blank blanked my blank, my blank, my blank. It blanked me. The wrong face might kill you. A certain change might be possible if the wrong face kills you. A certain change might be inevitable if the wrong face doesn't kill you. You think you drowned in the river, but really it was the city that killed you. You think you are the body that drowned in the river, but you are dead, and you do not get to control the circumstances surrounding your disappearance. Take a word and replace it with two words. You do not get to have feelings about the circumstances surrounding your disappearance. Take a body and replace it with another body. I do not get to have feelings about the circumstances surrounding my disappearance. Take an adjective and replace it with another adjective. I do not get to have feelings about the circumstances surrounding your disappearance. Take a verb and replace it with another verb. Take a noun and replace it with another noun. You do not get to question the circumstances surrounding my reappearance. It was a day he knew he would die an unspectacular death in the river of venomous aloneness. It was the night they knew they would die a spectacular death at the hands of the paramilitary nationalists who were armed by the secret police. It was an afternoon they knew they would survive and be forced to persist in a world where they'd rather be dead. Envy leaked from the mouth and vengeance dripped from the eyeballs. Petroleum dripped from the teeth and plastic straws were shoved into the nostrils. He gave his child a kiss on the forehead. He gave the bank a body that once loved him parentheses, but in reality, it was hard to have feelings, parentheses, and in fantasy, it was even harder to have feelings. He disappeared unspectacularly into the blank of the American night. Take a body and replace it with another body. I disappeared unspectacularly into the blank of the American night. 
take a verb and replace it with another verb, take a noun and replace it with another noun. I bloomed unspectacularly into the debt of the American night. Mm. I have a book that will come out next year uh, called Written After a Massacre in the Year 2018. Um, and these are a few pieces from that and I'll um, conclude there. Listen, the eyes that grope the sidewalk want to tell us something. They want to tell us the pain in your face has meaning. They whisper death into our mouths and they want us to know the death of our mouths has meaning. They whisper love into our eyes and they want us to know the obliteration of our eyes has meaning. They puke life into our bodies and they want us to know the betrayal of our bodies has meaning. The hypocrisy has meaning. The wreckage has meaning. The starvation has meaning. The grief has meaning. The exorcism, the void, the radioactivity, the contamination, the wind on our face, the apocalypse, the disappearance of the voice, the disappearance of the breath, the disappearance of the body, the sand and the mud have meaning. We pray because we cannot scream. We recline because we cannot sit. What breaks our bodies, it would have been enough. What feeds our bodies, it would have been enough. What loves our bodies, it would have been enough. And the dead cry out, Dianu. To take the bullet from the gun, to take the gun from the hand who shoots into the faces of those who mourn the street and the sidewalk, to take the hand from the body who murders the fig tree to defend himself. He obliterates the lilac to defend himself. He blows up the willow to defend himself. He shoots into the trees, but sometimes he hits the mourners. He wants their grief to disappear. He wants the sky to disappear. There shouldn't be so many birds in it. There shouldn't be so many insects in it, but the earth devour their bodies. One morning, a man shoots at the sky and tells it not to mourn so loudly. He shoots into the gardens where the mourners jump, where they dance, where they run, where they are afraid that they too will disappear into the earth, like the river disappears into the earth, like the tree of life that disappears into the earth, like the love that disappears into the earth, like the ancient language that disappears into the earth, the earth the children are tossed into when they don't know what country they come from. I'll conclude there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Edwin. And good night. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Beautiful work. We will talk. Um, let me see. Sharon, are you there? I don't see your face. Um, Well, um, okay, David, we'll go to you. I don't know where Sharon is, and we'll find her. Thank you, Daniel. Are you ready, David? I'm ready. Okay, David Rothenberg. When asked why he sang along with nightingales, the great Persian poet Sadi had this to say. I saw bulbuls commencing to lament on the trees, the frogs in the water, the beasts in the desert. So I bethought myself that it would not be becoming for me to sleep in carelessness while they all were praising God. Yesterday at dawn, a bird lamented, depriving me of sense, patience, strength, consciousness. One of my most dear friends who had perhaps heard my distressed voice said, I could not believe that thou would be so dazed by the cry of a bird. And so I replied to him, The 
گفت هم این شرط ادمیت نیست مرد تس بگوی او من خموش It is not becoming to humanity that I should be silent when birds chant praises. Nightingale, your song has been here long before we first arrived. Must we ask forgiveness before we join in? We've misread you for years, hearing madness, unfulfillable love. Your hymn is more sincere than that. Compelled to sing, you always know just what to do. When are humans ever so sure of anything? as long as we don't wipe out your world, don't completely figure it out, you're never going to stop. That's right, my bulbul friend. Please don't stop.
Thank you. Thank you, David. My blue blue friend, um, Sharon, are you there? We will all talk with each other at the end here. I'm looking for. There are a lot of people in their little home homes. Sharon, you disappeared again. Until she shows up. The um, let me unmute. The Christian. And Daniel, you're unmuted now, or you will be. Kristen, can you hear us? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Daniel? Sharon? I'm here. Okay. Has anybody seen Sharon? She came back for a second. <laughs> she wrote in the chat, I'm back. Yes. Let's talk briefly until she returns. This idea of... of, uh, of I'm here. I'm here. Oh, My connection okay. keeps going down. I'm sorry. Okay. My connection keeps going down. Okay. You know, I'm going to turn my video up. off. Ah. I'm Wait. turning my video off, but I can still read. Okay. Sharon, I can't find you. There's I know. I turned my video Got it. I turned my video off to save okay. bandwidth. So, everybody, the voice you hear is a um, disenchanted or disembodied um, reflection of what this book is about, where the voice travels whether we want to hear it or not, <laughs> whether it's there or not. <laughs> Luckily, it's Sharon. Whether you want it or not. Yes, exactly. Sharon, it's all, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to be reading um, some little stories from um, a collection of tiny stories that I'm working on called the Olston Blueth stories. And Olston Blueth is um, a character who was confined to the couch by his mother. And um, these are all told by him about his life. So this is called One, the Bodega. Sharon, I think we lost you. I'm sorry. Um, limbs they're carrying to whip the thief with. Okay, so um, she will return at some point. Kristen, Daniel, and David, you're all unmuted. Um, Julian, sorry, I, I can't. I'm not going to be able to do this. So this is you can send us your words, and we can read them. Yeah, I could. Yeah, that would work. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's going to, I'm going to be popping in and out and I think it's not going to work. So I'm just going to stop doing it. Do you want to try one short one? That was a short one. <laughs> I didn't even get through it. <laughs> See, can you, it's just, it's short. It's like one page and I couldn't even get through it. So I'm just going to not do it. Oh, uh... Now you're coming in loud and clear. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll, I'll start again, but if it cuts it out again, I'm going to stop. Okay, and if it cuts out, then we're going to start talking, and then you join us to talk. Yeah. One, the bodega owners. My earliest memory is of a summer day, sunny and hot. Three or four years old, I wanted to go play in the park, but mother said to stay cl close to home. The bodega owners were roaming the streets with branches in their hands. 
One of them got robbed, she said, and whenever something bad happens, they all close up shop and try to fix the situation together. It's like a tradition. Those are oak limbs they're carrying to whip the thief with. Mother put on a hairnet, and we went outside to watch the determined men march, snapping branches against their hands. People were peering through their half-open front doors, and the old ladies who always leaned out their windows on pillows called out encouragements to the group as they passed. The police had cleared the streets of traffic, and it was like we'd gone back in time to the good old days before cars. Old women pushed fruit carts and sang. Sunlight streamed gold-green through the trees. Isn't it a beautiful day, Alston, mother sighed as she sat down on the steps. The perfect day to stay home and just sit in a chair. I hope they never find who they're looking for, I said. I forgot to mention these are based on dreams, and I'm reading them because, uh, because I'm reading Kristen tonight. Five, the story of how a river taught me to breathe, or why I never asked mother for a sad story again. My second earliest memory is of mother telling me the story about how a river taught me to breathe. It was a hot summer evening. All the lights in the house were out, and the big box fan in the parlor window billowed the curtains halfway into the room. Illuminated by lamplight from the street, the furniture glowed like stocky ghosts. Mother had positioned my little wooden chair with a straw seat in front of the couch, and she sat behind me, running a comb through my hair. It was the family comb, passed down through the generations. Tell me one of your stories, Mother, I asked, a sad one this time. Once upon a time, Mother sighed, this house faced a river, a beautiful river that flowed over hill and dale. One day when I was pregnant, my fortune teller friend rushed over and told me you had died inside of me. She said if I rested my head on the window and listened to the river, it would whisper instructions to your lungs and you'd begin breathing again. But there's no river outside, I said. Where did it go? The government needed the land for the stockyard, so they channeled the river into a long, narrow vault with pumps that pushed it underground through the hills and then out a dirty pipe somewhere in Grundy County. They laid the street grid right over it, and that's why I named you Olston, after the river Olston that taught you to breathe. She stopped combing my hair. I noticed that the room smelled like sour milk, the way my own breath smelled when I cried. I knew mother had been moved to tears, but I didn't want to turn around and hug her because she wouldn't want me to see her crying. I remember wondering, is that the smell of the trapped river also crying under the street? I never asked for a sad story again. Three, the Mexican Shirley Temple. The Mexican Shirley Temple made quite a splash around here that one summer. Mother always thought I was a little too interested in the Mexican Shirley Temple and knew more about her than what I let on. I would say she was right. I first saw the Mexican Shirley Temple at the back of the yard's carnival, performing in the little circus. She also worked behind the funnel cake counter with Uncle Eld. I had wanted that job, and Uncle Eld knew it, but he gave it to the Mexican Shirley Temple. I think Mother might have told Uncle Eld not to give it to me because she didn't want me leaving the house, but I also have a feeling that the Mexican Shirley Temple might have seduced him. That's one reason I was not fond of the Mexican Shirley Temple. Another was her occupation. I thought it odd that she was working as an acrobat in a circus, which is usually something only younger people can do. The Mexican Shirley Temple was in her 40s, maybe early 50s. You also have to wonder about a trapeze acrobat who performs without underwear. I guess that was another reason why I resented the Mexican Shirley Temple, and maybe why Uncle Eld wanted her working the funnel cake counter. On the other hand, I admired her for her abilities. For instance, whenever I would tell Mother all about her mistakes and failures, I always Look at Elizabeth. And then look at Sharon. I can sort of see Sharon's 
name over the chalkboard if I look enough. Edwin, could you describe what Elizabeth is doing? I think I see... I'm going to pin her. So... This is getting at what I want to speak about a little bit, how there's so much information available to us now in the Zoom reality. There's so much sort of, it's either want or void being offered. And I see the in the intertwining and in the sort of chaotic cosmic on the chalk, um, conversations, trying to get out, trying to connect. I wonder if, if um, the four of us could talk a little bit about how, how you're seeing your work in this time because there's so much um, availability and is there a point where we just need to stop that availability? Or how do we nurture that inside ourselves to make something of this? Or is there nothing to make of what we think we're supposed to be making? I don't know. It's, it, it's kind of exhausting to have no excuse to get away from the screen. That all work happens through this thing that we were spending so many months criticizing and saying it was disembodied and it wasn't real life. And now you have to do it all day and you're talking to one person or two or 200 people and it goes on and on and there's no end to it. And there's endless streams of music and poetry and collaborations and it just goes and goes and goes and we're all kind of trapped and maybe we can walk outside, but then we come back to it and the screen is still there. It's sort of like we're trapped in, 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 creative, in, create, in the creative process. And when we weren't trapped, it was easy to see what we were doing. And maybe I wonder if you're constantly in it so much, where, where, does, the, where does the out come from? You can turn it off and leave. You can just go outside. And but then I'll miss slam the You're going to miss so much stuff, but you also see many more things like, you know, animals are taking over the streets, there's skunks and deer and beavers swimming in the marsh. And like, it's totally surreal out there. There's no airplanes. And Daniel, you're, you're talking about um, isolation and um, all these different um, approaches to where where you find yourself in. How do you approach that, this idea of too much information? Uh, um, how do I approach the idea of too much information? Is that the question? Like, too much, um, I don't know that that's, I don't know that that's like what is um, bothering. I, I think there's lots of other things that are bothering me. I don't know that too much information is bothering me. I think like you started by asking something about how we make work at this moment, right? And um, and um, and that I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I think. Um, I think like the first few weeks of being home, I was sort of like, uh, didn't understand what the point of writing would be or like what I thought writing should do or what literature should be at that moment. Um, and I'm still not sure I can like answer that question in any kind of satisfying way other than um, by saying like, um, by, I mean, and perhaps there's something kind of therapeutic about it for me uh, in some sense, and I don't like to use that language that often, but, uh, but on the other side of it, it sort of became like this other kind of excuse to not write um, was like this question of like, what the hell does writing mean at this particular moment that I feel like if I, I that if I solved it in any way, I just solved it by writing and trying to like make um, sense of what words might possibly do um, when they seem particularly meaningless. 
And Kristen, what, where does uh, uh, this, the meditation that, um, there's a bit of a meditative quality to what Daniel's talking about, where we're trying to travel somewhere. And, and your practice um, has a lot to do with that sort of, that travel externally, internally. What, what do you think? Um, yes, I apologize. I got a little distracted because Julie Carr was typing these incredible descriptions of Elizabeth. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read what she wrote. Sure. She was on her back with her legs over her head, her arms tracing circles on the ground slash chalkboard. Since she has chalk in her hands, she is drawing circles. Then she stood up and walked outside of the camera's reach. Now her arm is in the light. She is on her knees, head on the chalkboard, drawing with the one arm visible. She is wearing black, but her lower arm is bare and the light is on her lower arm and hand. So that's from Julie Carr in the comments. Um, I, be, uh, I suppose, I'm not really exact, I'm not sure what the question was, but I would just say that um, Gertrude Stein in the continuous present is, um, I believe, kind of the reality that I find myself in, having to really be in this kind of stream of the present moment. And it's very, it can be very oppressive. Um, whoever, whatever guru said that, you know, we need to, you know, um, come into the present moment and find enlightenment. That, that just sucks, right? It's like, it, it's hard. <laughs> um, so I find, um, and, I, and, and the thing about the screens is just, have we not been preparing for this entrance into the world of screens for the past? Have they not been preparing us? You know, I mean, it's really, um, the screens have taken over a kind of consciousness. I dream, I'm dreaming of screens. You know, I wake up and I think about people in squares um, who I'm in conversation with because I'm not in conversation really with anybody else. Um, I, uh, so it's like, I, it's a really altered um, consciousness. And I, and I think that it's also just, we are in the land of screens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so for me, writing has to be this, what, what is the continuous present? I, I can't write about the past. I can't write about the future. It's just like, what is, what is, what is the literal now in all of the shittiness of, and often bl moments of bliss, you know, moments of bliss, but also moments of impossibility in that. There's a point where you human. start like, you wonder if you're trying to make sense of something too much, as opposed to, like you're saying, letting the now be the now. And in, in, in that sort of nowness, you sort of dive deeper inside and look for answers. But sometimes writing just tells you that there are no answers. You just kind of continue moving on through it. Um, Sharon, are you there? No, okay, that's all right. So now um, I'm going to describe Elizabeth a little more, and we're going to, well, what I should say, oh, it looks like her, her foot is trying to land, but it's not landing. I should say that the series is going to be Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, we're going to have a wide variety of voices um, and performers. And right now, her heel is almost touching the bottom, but not quite. It's sort of like dying to hit the ground, but it's not. It's wondering why um, now the hands are trying to sort of like manipulate the foot without strings, but the strings have sort of become the drawings on the ground. So now we see white chalk on the hand coming towards the camera. Um, I wonder if each of us in the audience, you could write your own little thing, your own little um, description of that. You can always bring it back into the chat tomorrow. You can paste it and share it if you want. But that's so much of a thing. You can just watch and not do anything. Um, say, say again. I was just like, oh, is somebody unmuted? Oh. I'm sorry, me. Hi, Lydia. I thought I had, I thought I had total control. <laughs> no, that, you never have okay. total control. Uh, that, no. no one does. No, no, that's OK. No, I, I was just suggesting that you can kind of interpret what you're seeing and maybe share it with us tomorrow at the chat, but that's too much of a thing. Um, I think that, uh, um, I think we're close to the end here. Um, I, I wish Sharon 
would chime in a little bit, but that's okay. So be it. Um, Edwin, question, question from, from Nancy is, how is Elizabeth making the decisions about how she moves? Um, that's a good, well, get inside the head of the, um, of the moving object. I, I, I don't know. I think it's, 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 um, it's a good question. Let me, let me unmute her and let me just like, okay, let's see. Elizabeth? Yes. <laughs> How are you making your decisions to move? Um, they're just, they're, they're just, um, just waiting for sensation and, um, moving through sensation and sometimes what I'm hearing comes in and out, um, but more connecting to um, what I'm feeling, like what I'm, sensation coming through me, maybe about what I'm going, what I'm experiencing and uh, that could, there really are a lot of words, <laughs> but it's really just, um, it's, it does itself, sort of. But, and then sometimes words and sound come in and out, and I catch that and then come back in and then come out. Okay. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Um, I'm going to play a little more of the Corona music. Um, Does anybody else have anything else to add? Daniel, Kristen? Are we happy keeping it too close to an hour? It seems to work. So I'll, I'll just close saying, um, um, this was Kristen Prevole, Daniel Borsutsky, David Rothenberg, and Sharon Mesmer. As we go off into the evening and, and hopefully come back tomorrow, um, think of your own sensation. You can ask your questions about how you move or not. You can sort of like, you know, bring yourself to where you are. Somebody had a question? No. Is it my, my role to unmute everybody? Yes. Oh, That's a perfect end. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Edwin. See you again. <laughs> Thank you, Edwin. Thank you. I dropped out for a second there. Look at that. Look at everybody's face. Beautiful. Good seeing you. Good hearing you.